a few months back, I started, um, well, first, it's the year, you know, by now. <laughs> by now. Um, uh, I work at HP, uh, and uh, I heard about this topic, uh, well, I've been hearing it for years, but uh, on the news, you've been hearing about more of this quantum computing being one of the technologies that uh, should be invested in as because other countries are doing that, so I got, you know, got me thinking of what is so cool about this technology. And a few months back I started reading about it and I got excited about it and it's, I realized that if anything, and that's the impression that I want to give you guys, is that it's not as arcane or esoteric as you might think. It may be a little uh, um, it's a daunting to see all this math being used for, for uh, quantum computing. But at the end, if you work on it, you realize something about quantum mechanics that it is sort of like, no pun intended, but quantum mechanics becomes a little mechanical once you get the end of how to do the computations. So let's get started. Um, so um, quantum computing is one of the models of computations, of the drone models of computation that have been uh, used throughout uh, modern history. One is analog computers, analog computation. I know many people may not even know what an analog computer is. And it's a testimonial to my age that I used one when I was in high school. <laughs> So uh, they're still around, used for, not for the original purpose, but for other purposes, more like control. But they fulfilled their purpose before digital computers you know, came in of age. And of course, we all know about this digital, digital, digital uh, or what they call classical model of computation. And we call it classical as opposed to the quantum um, model of computation. And we refer to what you do in digital technology, that's the classical, classical bits, classical uh, algorithms, uh, classical computers. So when you hear me say classical, that's what I'm referring to. All right. The quantum uh, model of condition that you will see mostly is called the gate-based model. It's not the only model. There are other two proposed models of uh, quantum computation, what is called that enigmatic, and it's based on modeling the energy of the system. For those physicists, you know, in the Hamiltonian, uh, it's what's modeled in how the system evolves you know, in time, and that it, um, evolving in time gives you the computations that you uh, perform for, for the, um, the model, the quantum computer model. And there is another model which is measurement based and I all I know I can, I can tell you about that one is that um, it's based on measurement. The bits are entangled and we will go over this entangling thing that's I don't know this concept that's like sort of like mysterious and it, it for a reason, uh, and uh, um, they've been tangled and they, they measure, and they, that's the way computations are being performed. Um, you'll see that uh, there are different competing technologies for quantum computer. There's not really a like the winning or like the winner of all the technologies that have tried. People have tried with. Uh, Ion trap computers, superconductors, um, neutral atoms, which I don't know exactly what they are, in all honesty, but um, there are different technologies. They, they usually try it with light, photons of light, but uh, they're not stable, so even though they are easy to manipulate it for educational purposes, they're not reliable for um, practical quantum. Okay, so why quantum computing is called quantum computing? The point that the, the parts that make quantum computing uh, uh, model of its own are five. These, these concepts, 
the not existing cost of computing. So hey, these are the five things that make quantum computing what it is. What and you will not find these in the uh, classical computing. But quantum computing also can do what digital computers can do. So you could think of quantum computers as a percent of the classical computing. Uh, and you may think that at some point quantum computers will be the norm and digital computers will be obsolete. Nobody's thinking along those lines. People are thinking more that um, since quant developing quantum computers has proved to be a challenge because the stability of the, the atoms to keep them in the state that you need into this one or the zero, then what they're thinking of is more that quantum computers will be um, add-ons to classical digital computers. So for example, instead of, I'm sorry, besides having, let's say, a GPU or graphics processing unit, you might see in the future a quantum processing unit that you can have to your PC. That's the vision for you. But let's start um, with the concepts. So the first concept that you will see is qubit. And it's defined as a two-level quantum mechanical system, meaning that it has um, two levels of energy or some physical property that can be measured. Uh, the, of quantum computing is not restricted to qubits. There's qubits, for example. It's trial level bits, uh, uh, maybe use that term for now, bits that also are, no. uh, can be used. But right now, the, the, the more uh, prevalent they have, the, research is on qubits. Um, so qubits um, can, have, can have a zero and a one state, which could be, see, uh, say, different things like different properties, different physical properties of the atoms can be used as uh, levels for qubits. For example, you can have uh, the energies in your orbits of an atom. And you can have two levels of two, two of those, those orbits being the low, lower level zero and the high level one. For example, you can also use light, uh, light, polar, uh, light polarized in some way, some uh, uh, direction. And the difference which you see in the humans with respect to classical bits is that you start seeing that they're represented as vectors. Uh, and they, you, they use imaginary numbers. Yeah. I'll stay away from imaginary numbers for this presentation, but that's yeah. uh, part of the mathematics of quantum computing. And um, once you learn, that's the concept, but once you start, once you start manipulating those or doing an example with them, or you are simple as the, you simply ask the question, what can I do with that? You need to know the mathematics for the quantum computing. And the mathematics uses a lot of this called the representation. And I've seen presentations where computer scientists say that the thing that they hated the most about quantum computing was the notation, because it is a notation that it is very popular amongst physicists, but not very familiar for computer scientists. And um, the representation of a qubit is using the symbol called the ket. It represents a state. For example, this represents a zero. You have a vector, and if it's a one at the top, then it's a zero. And if it's one at the bottom, then it's a one. Simple as that. So this, is, this is a one, this is a secret quantum. Don't make it more complicated. We'll make it more complicated, but for now, just don't need to do that. So, the, the representation uses uh, these pairs of, of operators, of um, symbols, use kids and brass, and uh, of course, when you put them together, it's called the bracket notation. And 
when you represent a kid, you should represent a vector when it's a column. When you have a bra, you represent this, the, the cubit. Not very little air, uh, but the signal in. Unfortunately, the bad news is that there will be some math that will have to cover, but hopefully, it'll be, don't worry, there will be no twist. Uh, just, I promise, uh, so that's it. So. But, so, as I said, when you start learning what to compute, the first thing you see is a thing. A zero, well, this is, this is how you represent the zero. Um, the reason, as I said, <coughs> you use a vector is because there's a two levels. And if you have a value, this like you're measuring something this level, then you have a one. Um, and if you have, if you measure a value that is the opposite of the value in, in, a, in a, you know, some uh, quantum uh, physical property, then you, you have a one. Um, for example, uh, as I said, if you have this atoms, you put some lower level energy state that you, you yourself, by convention, consider lower level called zero, and when you measure that, you will have zero. If you excite the atoms, and then move the electrons to this next energy level, you say, well, that's my one. But there you go, you have a quantum <coughs> system that you can use for computation. Um, but things are not that simple, uh, fortunately. Otherwise, if this were the case, it would be like classical. Okay. The representation of, of the bits can also have uh, other values that will we'll see a reason for these values. It's not just zero or one. They can be in superposition states. So, just so you know, for when you learn the notation at the beginning, when you see all these brackets, all these symbols, you're like, you don't know how to make, you know, heads or tails of that. There are basically four operations, fundamental operations that you have to learn, and then you really get start getting the hang of how to use. That notation, the bracket That's the inner product, the outer product, the tensor product, and the matrix operators. And we'll see just each one of them. So the inner product is when you put together the brine and get the on this bracket. And all you do is multiply the vectors when you have a scalar number. You have a scalar here, and you get a number. So that's the simple step. If you see this, it means that you want to multiply this vector, which is my vector, with this column vector, and then you're going to get a number. Nothing more complicated than that. Then you can have, you will see some sort of brackets ordered this way. That means differently. That's the other part. And then you have a matrix multiplication that it is from this matrix and give you instead of a scalar, it's your matrix. So far, so good. This one is very, <clears throat> very heavily used in um, quantum computing. It's called the tensor product. And it is used to put together, uh, to represent the, the registers of. Uh, made by the qubits. And we'll see examples of that, but basically, if you have two qubits, system, you have a system with two <laughs> atoms, and you want to represent that mathematically, not just one qubit, but two qubits, then you have to put it in this form. You have to do the tensor product of both, and then you represent like this. So this is for those uh, who are good at the binary logic, you'll see that how Two qubits are represented as a couple of bits, a couple of, 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 of 
values. And the number of values that you can have to this to, to the end if you have two values to, to the four values. In this case, we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And you represent that the way you code that in quantum computing is you have a vector with the number of rows that corresponds to, to, to the end, in this case, four. And then you see how each value, each binary value, corresponds to one position in the vector, that product tensor of those two units. Um, okay, uh, this, I want to start making things a little bit more complicated. It's very difficult to see units like this represented like a sum of two bits, of two values, two states, but the better term, two states, with a amplitude here. And you do tensor part of those. It, the way you can represent this, these uh, uh, sums, also is the mean of whole vector. And then you perform the tensor product, and then you get values, which is this is what defines the probabilities of the states. We'll get to that. But this is what defines, defines how likely it is to measure each one of these states that the qubits can be in. So we have, in this case, four states. So in this case, we see that we have here a one qubit represented with this two, uh, uh, two one over square root of two. And then another qubit, this is a representation. So these two representations, this one and this one are equivalent. And that's one of their problems. Uh, some people do it some way, a little bit different way. And when you're reading all this math in them, so which way are you using? And you get, uh, get situations like, ah, okay, this is what you're doing based on the, this is what your style, so to speak. So you see a lot of textbooks using this, and almost not using this, and some other papers of textbooks using this notation here. So. so one thing that you, it allows you to do is that this tensor product is, as I told you, is you have two qubits. And how do you represent those two qubits in terms of their states? Well, um, you, you uh, um, as I said, you multiply two bits and get one vector with uh, the four values, zero, 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 four, the four amplitudes for zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. And this is and something important. The amplitudes here, these coefficients that you see here, are this you see here, have to add up to the squares of those coefficients. Add up has have to have add up to one. And that is known as the Born's rule. So the you will see that. But the, I'm I'm going over the notation without giving you the concepts, so maybe it's confusing, you will see the concepts. One thing that I, I want you to notice here is that um, you can have two, two qubits combined. And then you say, okay, uh, I can represent them like this, or I can represent them uh, uh, this sum, but you can factor them out. Um, and uh, we'll see something called entanglement, and then that's what we see. It's, that's not always the case. Um, so for example, in this case, I have these two qubits multiplied. I'm using the solution vectors. And then I use the tensor product. I get these values, one half minus one half, one, one half, and then minus one half, and both. And if you think about it, if you square this one half, it's one fourth. So 
if you add one fourth, one fourth, one one fourth, you're gonna have one, which is the total probability of the fourth states. But what this is telling you is that the probability for each state is one fourth, 25 percent probability. That means that if you have two qubits, so what are you gonna measure? Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Well, depending on on the vector or the, the probability that they have, most likely you will measure one state or the other, or all will be equally probable, depending on probability. So, circuits to see the gates, but in reality what they are, they are mathematical, mathematical operators, which at the end of the day, the mathematical operators are just matrices. So those, those matrices are used to operate on, or to do mathematical operations on qubits, and alter the bits. Of course, this is a mathematical representation of something that in hardware, you would do, you would say, invert this qubit. And that's what you'll see in your Qiskit language, or Q sharp, or circuit, which is the Google language. But at the end, that is translated into some hardware mechanism, hardware way to operate on the state of, a, of an atom. Um, the, one thing that I want to make stress is that, as you are seeing from this presentation, from this discussion, we're not dealing with the inner workings of a quantum computer. We're not dealing with all the details of the atomic levels and the orbits and anything like that. What is quantum computing is, is aspiring to is the same thing as classical computing, is to have people write programs for quantum computers where all those details are abstracted out. All you have to uh, be concerned about is how do you manipulate the qubits. The hardware will do it for you. But you are not only concerned about this. And you don't need to be, uh, this is important, uh, you don't need a PhD in theoretical physics to do quantum computing. You can do it just knowing what the differences are Classical and quantum, you know, the five, uh, five um, character features of quantum computing that I'm um, uh, going through. And um, what are the operators and how to use some of the math, which is the Dirac notation. So once you learn that, you basically are ready to start tinkering and learning and using quantum computers. Quantum computers are more available now than they were in the past. Um, you can use them over the cloud. Uh, IBM offers its uh, quantum computers for people. Of course, you know, um, 
Uh, and, but also, what's more available now is languages that you can, the simulators for quantum computing, which are uh, you can run on your laptop. Uh, they're now in, available in Python. And for Qiskit, for example, the, the language that was developed by IBM, they offered you this uh, package, Python, Qiskit, that you can uh, install. And, and of course, once you create your circuits and you run them on your laptop, you may say, well, I'm cheating. Well, yes, but still, they do a very good job simulating one computers. They're, they're getting to the level that they can give you results for which you don't need a quantum, an actual quantum computer. So, so Guillermo, I was going to ask, it's not airtime on actual quantum computers. It's quantum simulators. Okay, for this one, it's actual time of the quantum computing. But there are, for example, Microsoft offers quantum computing, quantum Azure, and they offer two options. One is real quantum computers uh, provided by Honeywell, and the other is quantum-inspired uh, computation, whatever they mean by that, that you can use over the cloud to perform, uh, to, to do quantum computing. And of course, they have the Q sharp, the quantum sharp, the Q sharp language available for anybody to install on your laptop. That's, that's, so if anything, I want to impress you, quantum computing is becoming more readily available to people. It's not what it used to be, it's accessible. And it's something that, uh, I can do it. I, can do it. <laughs> I don't know. I know better way to say that. So let's go back. Uh, okay. <clears throat> let's now start talking about the quantum mysterious esoteric. This preposition of space. In the quantum realm, one of the first things that scientists realized was that when they were measuring atoms, they got measurements that were variable. They were not always the same. And they thought, well, maybe it is because at the beginning it's there's some atoms that have this property and some other atoms that were some something that we don't understand, something know. hidden in, 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 the, in the physical properties that eh, makes them behave differently. Over time, they realize that that is not the case. Atoms and photons can be in what is called the superposition of state, which is a combination of states. And the typical example is um, you have polarized filters. Uh, if you have one filter, it's polarized, say, vertically, and then you put another filter in front of it, polarized horizontally, then you block all the light, no more light, you know, goes through. But if you change the second filter to some other degree, say 45 degrees, then you start seeing some light. You see half the light. And then you may think, well, why is that? Because why I could not see anything, and why when I rotate one of the filters, I can see half light, and if I keep rotating, I see all the light. He, after you know that research, this is I'm talking about almost 100 years, um, and other discoveries, they realized that it is because the photons, in this case, of light, are in both states. Well, I should not say this because this is the dust hairs. They are in a combination of states. And this is what makes quantum computing um, interesting, but at the same time uh, weird because of this. If I tell you I have a qubit, and it's in a superposition of a state, means that it's in some possible in a possible uh, uh, set of states with different probabilities or same probability, who knows? But 
when I when I say when I ask a question, okay, uh, what the state is in? The, the answer is we don't know. But I say, okay, I want to know. Okay, then you go and measure. When you measure, you say you get a measure. You say a zero or a one. And at that point, you all those states that you didn't know about this, all this combination, it say they you turn the physicist, you see it collapses into just one value that you measure for zero or one. So that means that quantum computing has this weirdness. You don't know the state of your qubits until you measure. Of course, the first thought that comes to mind is, what is that good for? Well, it is good because all that superposition of states was, can be used to parallelize computations. And uh, there are, have been algorithms proposed since 1991 that um, beat or uh, overperform the, the classic uh, algorithms. I'll mention one at the end. But the point we're going to make is that quantum computing has that property or problem you want to see. You don't know what is the state of a qubit until you measure. So you may say, well, I'll do all my operations and I measure that. And sometimes that's the way you know quantum computing works. Not always, but that's usually the way. So I don't know if this is clear, but what I'm trying to say is that when you have a qubit, until you measure it, you don't know if it's zero or one. As simple as that. And that's called the superposition. So it's it's weirdness because you may say, well, then what, what can I do with it? And not only not only it's kind of like ironic, because if you think about it, the a uh, combination of the states that the qubit can be in, it's information. And once you measure, you say you collapse, and you lose that information, that combination, so the probabilities that you have. And the, well, once you lose that, you may wonder, well, what can I do with this kind of computation? Because once I measure that, I lost that information, and there's no more qubit anymore. At that moment, once I measure, it's a classical bit. So that's the way a quantum computer works. During the moment where you're not measuring, you have this superposition of the things. Once you measure, you see a zero and a one, and then ah, you're in familiar territory. That's classical computer. That's the way quantum computer <coughs> works. Um, the irony here is that Look what I'm saying. If you measure, you lose the superposition of states you had, and you collapse it to a zero or a one. So that means that if I have some qubit in a superposition of a state, zero or one, I don't know, but this, you know, this combination of states, and I read it because I want to copy it, too. what happens? Then I lost the whole image. So. In quantum computing, copying things like you see in classical computing is not possible. In fact, having RAM memory is sort of like not really the same concept. You cannot implement the same way because if you store a qubit and say, oh, I did, well, let me see if it's stored, whether it's stored or not. You go and check it off, oh, sorry, you lost the superposition of the state. So now you're measuring a zero or a one. Sorry. At that point, Lost all the information. So that's something that even when you start learning that, you even wonder, what can I do with this? Well, why is this useful? We'll see. Okay, as I said, you have this is the representation of a qubit. Usually, this letter, the letter psi, and then you see this values here, which would be imaginary values. Complex, are complex values, the, the, the number. but uh, they have the square, the square of those values is what Max Born in 1926 
discover and said that is the probability of measuring this thing. So you have some coefficient here, you square it, and that will give you the probability of measuring E0. You have this coefficient here, you square it, that gives you the probability of measuring E1. So that's how you this, the, the, uh, describe the superposition. You say 50% 0, 50% 1 over, 20% 0, 75% 1. That's how you describe superposition at the end of the day, mathematical terms. And one of the things that uh, I hate to say, but that's why we have to see the mathematics, is that a lot of concepts in quantum mechanics can make you, you know, have this nice philosophical conversations with the beer in your hand for hours and hours, but at the end of the day, it is the math that leads you and um, should guide you in how to understand the concepts. Am I, have I apples in this group? All right. So I said this is one example, and this is very typical. This, you see this, you have a qubit, and then you see this amplitude, it's called amplitude, which is one square root two. Once you square it, you get one half, and then you see, you add them up, and then you know this probabilities have to always add up to one. And what this you can read from here, nothing else is that this qubit is in a superposition of two states, each one with this probability. Right. Then you, you're reading now. So if I'm understanding this right, in its most basic form, it's kind of like a Markov chain, which like you're tracking the probabilities of like what this like what are the odds that it's in this state, but you still don't know until you check it, sort of thing, and then introducing circuit. Well, in a way, like a, like a Markov chain in terms of like you can go like you know out the state and then you go either way to another state. Right. You know, that's an interesting uh, analogy. I think, yeah, I think in a way it applies. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you end up with like the square root of the probability of one for like a column instead of just the no, square root of the. Uh, 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 I, I'm good. I was just thinking okay. out loud mostly. But I, I'm trying to erase digital computing from my mind as I listen to you. Seems like that's the best approach. Yep. I'm guessing there's no such thing as a box sequence cycle. It's all it's all all the states are there at once and then you measure and there's the answer. It's not in a way it's not it, clock cycles. Uh no it you well did you you it depends because one of the models that I that in cover but one thing Quantum models is automatic. It basically does um, computation over time. You have the Hamiltonian, and you say, okay, at this time, what is the state of the system? And then you have this, yeah. and then you compute upon it. Say one second later, or one millisecond later, you boop, compute another one. And in a way, you have a sequence of, of, of uh, uh, superpositions that are occurring, can change according to your manipulation, your gates that you are. Or you may create a student dilemma for me in that I thought if you measured it, it's gone. That is correct. If you measure it, it's gone, but uh, at the gates are they implemented at the hardware level, they do not measure, they manipulate, change things. So you have an atom and then you apply some, for example, there's one video on YouTube about the, some guys developing a uh, quantum computer based on uh, microwaves where they have this property of the electron that spin, I don't know, but spin up or spin down. If it's up, it says it's a one. If it's down, it's a zero. And the way they change the, the state of the spin up or down is via or by applying microwaves. 
So, and what this person this developed, this physicist was saying was that depending on the frequencies and how the energies are applied by the waves, they can induce a one, a zero, or some state in between, which would be a superposition of this. So they put the electron in some state that is not one, that is not zero, it's, it's this. It's a superposition, it's between the zero and the one. And they do it, they do it with, um, I'm trying to remember the material, Oh, yeah, in microwaves. What I'm trying to appreciate though is the next state depend on the previous state to in in an ongoing computation. It's so you're at state zero and then you get a result. Do I when I go well excuse me, you're at sequence zero. And you get your results. Now you go to sequence oh, one. Okay, but, okay, language learn. Uh, when you say you're in state zero and you get your results, for me, you mean means yeah, that you measure the state word. Sorry. No, 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 no. You're fine. You're, you're, I'm, I'm trying to be more precise because that's the problem with this. Uh, if you say you get results and then you measure, gone, gone. Okay. No more superposition. It's a it's a zero problem. But does the superposition come back after you stop measuring that qubit? No, if you don't put it the in. first time you measure the qubit, the superposition is just gone, and then it becomes a regular bit. Okay. Forever and ever, you have to apply some, you know, as I said, some energy or something. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, can you explain the oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I can give you some idea of how it's being used, or what is no more like what is intent of the quantum computing. Uh, there is a uh, series of algorithms that have been developed since 20 years ago that's called the CAN. It's like uh, I think like eight algorithms. One of the most famous, or maybe the most famous, is was developed in 1994. called Short Algorithm, and that one it's famous because it. Uh, it, that is, uh, that you know, algorithm deserves a presentation in and of itself. But anyway, that algorithm can factor prime numbers much faster than classical computers. And some people are saying that that algorithm can be the you know the uh, demise of uh, RSA cryptography because that the Right now, we're relying on all the computation for cryptography based on the you know this slowness of our classical computers taking millions of years to factor prime numbers. And if you see the curves, it's because they, the time they take is exponential, but the time this algorithm takes is more its n, where n is the number of bits cubed. So it's it's still slow. But much, 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 but uh, orders of magnitude faster than classical algorithms. So, is it true that, like, using that, we can make a system that we know that is random into being deterministic? Because I am thinking about like bugs that have to be fixed within a quantum computer. Um, is that system using these mathematical equations made deterministic? Is that the, is that a deterministic system? Would you still get? Uh, I mean, even with deterministic uh, systems that we have right now, computers, you can get uh, overflow errors, and you can get like all sorts of unsafe uh, systems. You can make it uh, uh, deterministic. I don't. Um, I don't know if that's what you would want to do yeah. because at the end, uh, maybe I should. Uh, uh, so the bad because going into studying those algorithms that I just mentioned, these eight algorithms, give you the idea like, ah, that's why they had, that's why I mean, there's so much people talking about this. Because when you see these algorithms, you see how some things are sped up like significantly, like orders of But right now what I'm going over is just the basic concept. I guess the, to simplify what I've been trying to ask, mm -hmm. maybe some others have been trying to ask, you give it uh, 
you give it a problem and you're getting an answer, I'm just trying to understand, is that a sequence of steps or is it just done it's all a sequence. Once? It's still a it's sequence, a sequence of, steps of steps where you do not measure the weeds. Secret it that way. That's not exactly accurate because sometimes there are some secrets that you measure in between. But think of it that way as you manipulate, 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 and then you measure. Zero, so one. Okay, or you thank are you. manipulating all these prepositions of states. Now, between those steps, is it a clock cycle controlling that? Or what is it? Is it just. Oh, I see what you <laughs> Time. Is it, is it just. No, it's atomic not. speeds or something. Is it? In other words, each you know, step's waiting for a completion, of a, and then it passes to the next step. What's what's actually going on between steps? At the quantum level, uh, I don't know if. Uh, uh, you so it, it, it does take time. Right, it's right. That's it's time, right. It's no, just a the, lot the end, Yes, at the end, yes, it, it takes time, and at the end, they're not supercomputers that. Can keep you up. actual prime numbers like two. They may take minutes, they may take days, compared to years, for example. But, the each, but it's still, they're still each time. step is it's higher time. parallelization. Yes. Okay. There's still time. Yes. That's a good yes. No, definitely. Yes. Perfect. Thank <laughs> you. Yes. Okay. This is the other concept that it's mysterious, and it was so mysterious that the famous quote from Albert Einstein is that it is spooky action at a distance. Why is that? Well, let me start with the math. As I told you, if you have two bits, you describe the probabilities of the four states they can be in 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, with this vector. The probability is here. Now, I told you that in the previous slide, I went over it, well, maybe I can go back, but the point I'm trying to make is that. Sometimes you, you may have values here that you can factor out and say, aha, my two bits were black and black. Okay? You solve that as an equation. Are we? Good? Ah. Well, you have four bits. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I want to finish here the, uh, up with this concept. And, uh, if you guys want, I think. Yeah. Uh, cool. th this, this vector here has two probabilities, you know, on both uh, extremes, both uh, top and bottom. And if you try to find out what were the values that you multiplied here to get this probabilities, you said, ah, there's no solution for this. No mathematical solution for this. So in, in physicists saw this back in the 30s, and they wondered, what's going on here? Why? And they theorized that there could be the possibility that two bits, well, two atoms, or two qubits in this case, can be in a state where they cannot be separated. They're correlated. They cor I'm using the word correlated because, unfortunately, our language uses analogies to represent the quantum world. And uh, in this case, the entanglement is the phenomenon where you have two qubits connected or correlate one with the uh, other. And there have been famous experiments. There was a famous experiment done by the Chinese where they uh, uh, put two qubits in a pentanglement state. They sent one to space. And using a laser, they kept the, the entanglement. And what happens when you have two qubits entangled is that they can be both in their superposition of the states. You don't know whether you have zero or one, both in either case. You don't know. What it makes, the things that makes entanglement very strange and spooky is that no matter where the qubits are, with the two extremes of the universe, the here next to okay. Once you measure one, you collapse it, you collapse it all. And it doesn't matter if you're, whatever, Mars or Jupiter or whatever, the action occurs instantaneously. So there's this idea that, oh, that's faster than light. And people say, aha. Some people saw it again. They thought they were being smart and said, we have faster than light communication. Well, no. Entanglement allows you to, or is a phenomenon where you modify one bit. 
one place, and then you instantaneously modify the other one in the other extreme of the universe. Doesn't matter. But that doesn't mean that you can transmit or you you can transmit information. You're collapsing this, but you're not transmitting information. Information cannot be, as far as we know, transferred at higher than the speed of light. But the phenomenon is still, you know, valid. So it's, you have two qubits that are connected in space, and that it's been ex um, demonstrated by a series of experiments. Where do the complex numbers come from? The wire was the purpose behind using the complex numbers. Well, the complex numbers came from uh, the the mathematics that described the quantum world correctly were uh, called the Hilbert space, and it uses based on complex numbers. So what I'm not saying here is that this is just a subset, a sample of what is called the Hilbert space in the world of mathematics. But I don't want to make things more complicated. But that's where they come from. And they describe correctly um, the, the, not only the difference in, in values, like the properties, but also the difference in what's called phases. And that way you see the, the imaginary numbers, the root square root of minus one, uh, time? Uh, it's 8.30. Alright. It's been two hours. That's what? total between you and Thomas. Uh, yeah, it's my fault. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just say one thing. One minute. Just leave you with this. <laughs> this guy. This guy was the first one that made quantum computer physics. Why? Because this is a solution of a problem that we will make you say, what? Why is that problem important? But anyway, you have a function which is a black box, and you don't know what the function does. It's just a black box, but you can input something, and, and uh, you see the output, and it's okay. Well, I don't know exactly what it is, but I can have a function which is one bit, and as input, and if I see a zero, and no matter what I input to the black box, but well, I see this is a constant function, whatever, okay? And if it always gives me a one, a constant function, okay? So this black box always gives me a one, so always gives me a zero. Oh. Or they say, okay, but guess what? That black box can also have a balance function, meaning that I'm going to give you, for your number of bits, half of them will be ones and half of them will be zeros. So it's called the constant versus the balanced function in a black box. You don't know. Right. And this is the deal. In classical computing, in order to solve that problem, well, let's start with this. How many questions do I have to ask to the function? If I input a zero, when I get a zero, what do I know? If I input a 1 and I get a 0 again, it's constant. Okay? So I have to query the black box twice. All right? In the best case. In the worst case, when you have 64 bit or whatever, 128, you have to query up. In the worst case, you have to query like 2 to the n times the function. I'm not going to show you how the math is another presentation, but this guy can tell you in just one computation whether or not you have a constant or a balance. And of course, you're wondering what the heck is that good for, right? It's the basis of our other algorithms that have been computers. But this guy showed how quantum computing can beat classical computing in some cases. Like, for example, for this problem, where you, instead of doing this 2 to the n, okay, queries to the function once, just once, and just apply a bunch of zeros in a one year, and all this quantum computer machinery tells you if you get a zero, it's a constant, if you get a one, it's balanced. Just one, one iteration. 
set up the query, 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 or ask the function, running the function, running the function, running the function. No, 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 no. That's just once. Cool. Okay. Uh,